going to stand for the reading of God's word. Um, we're going to jump into the book of Nehemiah. Before we jump into scripture, though, I'm going to give you a little context of what I'm about to read to you so that you can find yourself in this scripture. Uh, we're going to start Nehemiah chapter 1, and, and Nehemiah uh, has just gotten some news uh, from his brother. They've traveled back from uh, Jerusalem to where Nehemiah was in, in Persia. And he says, hey, how are the Jews? How, how's Jerusalem? How are God's people doing? And his brother says, hey, I got some bad news for you. I've got some bad news. They're not doing great. They're not doing well. The city's in ruin. They don't know what to do with themselves. And this is where we're going to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 1. Look at verse 4. It says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept. And I mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. And I said, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses, but God, remember the word that you told Moses, saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples, but if you return to me, can somebody say, return to me? Return to me, and keep my commandments and do them. Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. I'd like to title today's message, a burden to build. We're going to pray and then we're going to dive in. Father God, thank you so much for another year. Thank you so much, God, that we can gather together in your house. God, I pray that you move hearts today. I pray that you shift people from where they are. God, that they just take one more step closer to you today. God, I pray over today in 2023, God, that it's the best year yet for Victory City Church. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. As you grab your seats, tell everybody Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Well, here we are. As we said, 2023, it's a new year. Um, new resolutions. Come on, I've seen all your Facebook posts. You're already making them. You're already excited about, hey, it's a new year, new me, baby. Come on, here we go. Right? I know. I know how it goes. Uh, how many of your New Year's resolution fans? Come on, you do the New Year's resolutions. Come on, participate. Yes, you are shame. Some of y'all are going, yes, I do do that. Come on, New Year's is fun. Resolutions are fun. We like to make them. We make them every single year. Maybe you're a word of the year person. I don't know. Maybe you're, uh, hey, I'm, I got one new goal for the year, resolution that I'm going to make. Um, I, I want to share uh, some statistics with you. Are you ready? You ready to, like, learn some things today? Come on. Come on, you got to participate today, Victory City. Come on. So I, I want to share with you that the number one New Year's resolution in the world, the number one, it is the leader in the clubhouse for years running. There is no competition. The number one New Year's resolution that people like to make is I want to be healthier. I want to be fitter. I want six-pack abs. I want to go to the gym. I want to work out. I'm going to be a New Year, new me. It's going to be incredible. This is going to be awesome. And man, it sounds good. And it feels good. Just me saying it, I feel healthier already in 2023. Right? I, it, it feels good. And I, I, I'm gonna, so I'm going to confess. Ready? Here's, here was my New Year's resolution in 2022. Okay? You're the first people to hear the results. So lean in and listen. That I made a goal in, in 2022 that I was going to lose 15 pounds. 15 pounds. Now, I'm happy to report I got 20 more to go, but I'm still working on it. Like I'm getting there. You know what I'm saying? People are like, this is the right church for me today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But it, so, so everybody likes these resolutions. They want to get healthier. They want to get fitter. They want to look better. Well, then I kept reading about this, you know, the number one resolution people like to make. And here's what I found out is um, by February, 91% of the people that make that resolution have already fallen off the wagon. They've just, they, like, they hadn't been to the gym in three months, and they went one day and never went again. I had a friend tell me one time that, uh, he, he said, hey, Mike, I want to share something with you. 
If you want to look better, if you want to feel better, if you want to work out, just know that the heaviest piece of equipment at the gym is the front door. <laughs> Pow! Talk about conviction. Like, it has hit me right here. Like, there is no, you got to get through the front door so that you can get to the weights and the treadmill and all the things that make you feel great and all the broccoli you're going to eat and all the not fried foods. I'm from Alabama. Everything we do is fried. I mean, everything we eat is fried. Praise the Lord. See, somebody over there, they're from the South. They know it. So we got these things called resolutions, and, and they make us feel good. And, and, but, I, but, but we never, like, we have a hard time, obviously, like, keeping up with, with these promises that we make to ourselves. Like, like we get, because we get to this place, right? The reason why we make a resolution is because there's something that we're not satisfied with. Right? I mean, there's something that we don't like about ourselves. There's something that we don't like about what we're doing or how we look, how we feel. And we go, you know what? I'm going to make a change today. I'm going to make a change. And it, and it kind of, the way I see this in my mind, it's like you're, you're, it's content versus discontentment. Right? I'm content, then I'm, but I'm not really content. Like, I'm satisfied, but then I'm not satisfied with how I look. I may be satisfied in other areas of my life. But, but for whatever reason, I, I, I'm not satisfied that I don't have six-pack. You know what I mean? Like, that just bothers me. So there's this whole, like, wrestling that you do, right? There's this whole wrestling that you do with, am I satisfied with my life? Am I not satisfied with how I look, my health? All these kinds of things. And, uh, and we wrestle with this all the time. Um, but all for, like, stuff that helps build us. Think about that for a second. We, like, the whole idea of a New Year's resolution for most of us is, is for us to be better. It's kind of like a contentment versus discontentment is kind of one of those selfish things, right? Where I want to be better. Now we say, I want to be better for other people. I want to live longer. I, no, you just want to fit into the bikini in the summer. I understand. Like, I get it. Like, you just want to be able to put on the board shorts and pop, pop, there it is, right? Because the Instagram pictures look a whole lot better. Well, come on, I'm preaching to somebody already. They're like, man, he has been all up in my social media page, right? But we wrestle with this whole idea of discontentment and contentment, and it's really wrapped around me. At least that's the way that I see it with myself. It's all about what's best for me. And you know, I, I, I got to thinking about that. I, I don't know how many of you have kids. Come on. How many of you got kids? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got them too. I got two of them. I got a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old. And, and if you've been coming to Victory City for a little bit, you probably know uh, who they are. But my 13-year-old Maddie, she is, uh, she is a great kid. She is creative. She's quiet, yet she talks all the time. But you know, when, <laughs> right? I know. If she likes you, she talks all the time. Um, she doesn't, good luck. She just won't say anything to you. But I noticed something, Catherine and I, my wife and I noticed something when she started grade school. Years ago, when she started in first grade, when they started, we would have uh, scheduled parent conferences where you had to go to it. You were like on the bad parent list if you didn't show up to these things, right? And so they had them periodically throughout the year. And it's where you go in and you sit down and they tell you what's good, what's going well with your child, what's not going well with your child, how, they, how they're doing socially, behaviorally, all those types of things. And so we would sit down and hear kind of all the same, same things with Maddie. Hey, she's a good student. She works hard, that kind of a thing. But then after about the second year, uh, we noticed a pattern. We noticed a pattern that, that um, when, when a new kid would move in, or there was a kid that in her class that maybe wasn't familiar with the whole class or, or maybe was off by themselves, she would take it upon herself to go over to that child and, and befriend them, right? Now, I would like to tell you that we are incredible parents <laughs> and that we raise our kids that way. We do not. We do not. That's not something that we, we talk about, but we don't force our kids to do. But we notice this, like, where, where her teachers are like, hey, if a new kid moves in, because we lived in a military town, it was very transient, then Maddie would be the one and go over to them and sit with them at lunch or, or whatever and make sure that they had a friend. So me being the curious dad, I decided to ask some questions to my daughter, who was in first and second grade. And I, and I would ask her, I went to her one day, I said, babe, like, like, I hear you're a great friend to people. I hear that you're like the kids in your class, like you, you're always going to the one that maybe doesn't have a friend yet so that they have a friend. Like you're, 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 
like, that's awesome. Tell me a little bit about that. And she looked at me, and she was like this tall, and she said, well, Dad, like, if I was sitting by myself, I'd want somebody to sit with me. If I was new to a school, I'd want somebody to come and, and talk to me. If, 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 if I was walking down the hall and I didn't have a friend, I'd want somebody to come talk to me. And she said, like, I just want someone else to do that to me, so I'm going to do it for them. And you go, man, that's a golden rule, isn't it? Like, that's great. That's awesome. But then she went on to say, hey, Dad, as long as students show up to my school, uh, they, they will always have a friend. It won't, not on my watch, Dad. Not on my watch. They, they won't walk down the halls, and I won't talk to them. Now, if you know Maddie at all, like I mentioned earlier, you're like, whoa, where did that child come from? I don't know. I have no idea. But what I learned from her in that moment is there was something that wasn't satisfied in her soul. When a kid moved in and didn't have a friend, there was something inside of her that she just couldn't, she couldn't settle. She could not, she couldn't sleep at night almost. She said, Dad, I'd wake up and I just knew that that guy or that girl moved in and I had to go be their friend. And something wasn't settled in her. And I got to thinking about that. That's some, a story that's never, ever left me. And so I started walking through this whole discontent. This whole something that sits inside of us that all of us deal with and all of us walk through. See, I think that's where Nehemiah was when we picked up in this story. This is Nehemiah's prayer to news that he heard. News about the people of, of Jerusalem. The city torn down, broken, into pieces. And there's some, there was something in him that didn't settle with him. That, that set in him and that was I, I, almost like a divine discontent. It had nothing to do with him. Mind you, he was in the palace in Persia. The Bible says he was a cupbearer to the king. That's a pretty good gig. He made sure that the wine wasn't poisoned. He was always around the king. It's a heavy thing. It's a weighty thing. But he was in his own world doing his own thing, and he had it pretty good. He had it pretty good. But he heard this news of a place the Bible says that we don't even know that Nehemiah had ever been to Jerusalem. And something stirred in him. A, a divine discontent. And the Bible says that he stopped and he wept. Come on, I'm, I'm sitting here and challenged by this whole thought of divine discontent. And I ask myself that question. When does discontent move to a burden? That we carry inside of us. For me, when does discontent, all of a sudden, divine discontent be become a burden that I carry inside of me that I have to do something? That I have to, I can't take it anymore. I can't stand it any longer. I got, I got to move. I've got to, see, I believe burdens move us to action. Bur burdens, burdens can't sit inside, they'll eat us alive. We got to do something. Come on, your husband has to, like, hit the laundry hamper. Like, it's a burden. Come on, wives, you know what I'm talking about. Like, the dirty clothes is right here, and this pile of clothes is right there. And it's like, how? you can't take it any longer. No, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a divine discontent that says, you know what, it's not about me. See, I, I love what, what Nehemiah is walking through right here. I can... I can feel the tension, I can feel the discontent that he wasn't satisfied. The people of Jerusalem, as I mentioned earlier, had been enslaved by the Babylonians, and they were beginning to come back to their city, a city that was destroyed. They were returning to destruction. And Nehemiah is walking through the process of grieving. He's walking through the process of di di divine discontent. And he prays this prayer to God. And we're not going to dive into it today because we don't have enough time. But after this prayer, God does something that shifts something in his heart. And he's able to go back to Jerusalem and he surveys the city. And he says, you know what? The first thing that we have to build is the wall. The first thing we have to build is the wall. We have to rebuild it because the people are going to need protection from the enemy. See how a, bird, a divine discontent turns into a burden and it moves you to do something. Come on, some of y'all are like, ra -ta 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 -pa 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 on social media. That's what happens when I get a divine discontent. I have to post about it. 
Some of y'all are like, wow, okay, who's this guy? I need Pastor Eric to come back quick. <laughs> See, in Nehemiah's day, there was a literal wall that established that was established to protect people from the attacks of the enemy. It made them feel safe. It made them feel secure. Friends, our culture today, there's a war. There's a war on identity. Um, there's a war on the family unit. There's a war on biblical marriage. There's a war going on right now where the walls are being torn down of people's lives. Can I, just get, can I just get real for just a second? Yeah. Yeah. There's a war going on where the culture of ideology stands at the footholds and the, store, the storefronts of our churches and says, I will tear it down. But how many of you have a divine discontent that says, not on my watch? <laughs> not on my watch. It says we have to do something. It's these internal burdens when our heart breaks for people is what moves us to action like it did Nehemiah. Not for our glory, not to build our personal platform, for not for people to praise us. It's so that God can do things through broken people, that he can do a mighty work in the lost. And the people who struggle, maybe they struggle with sexual identity. The person who's stuck in addiction, the family ravaged by infidelity. Come, for people who have so much shame because of what they've done or had done to them, the only hope that they have is a hope found in Jesus. That is the war that we're in today. That is the burden that we have to have. A divine discontent that we carry in our hearts to go, we have to do something. We have to do something. And this is where you find, Nehemiah, we're burdened to build not so that we can go higher, but for God to reach wider. Well, this is not for us. We're not, we're not interested in being a big church. We just want a big heaven. We're not interested in, a, in, just, in just having a bunch of people assembled together. We, we're interested in having a whole bunch of people assembled and aligned to the word of God so that when culture comes and says, I'm infiltrating this place, we're lost and broken people, are we go, no, 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 we stand and we stand unified at the, at, together and we go, no, 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 devil, you can't be in here today because there are people that are going to meet Jesus and their life's going to be changed for forever because the burden in us is too much for us to carry where we can't do something. We have to do Something. And you see Nehemiah's reaction. So I built you up. You're like, oh, I'm ready to do something. I'm ready to, it's 2023. What are we going to do? See, burdens, holy burdens, divine discontent, they'll move you to action. The thing that I learned about Nehemiah's prayer, where Nehemiah was the first thing that he did, so I think there are three things that we can get from this prayer. Is that divine discontent, a burden to build, will move you to plead for people in prayer. You notice that Nehemiah didn't take off to Jerusalem first. Look at what it says. It says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I mourned for days over people that he didn't even know. People he had never met. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. See, a burden to move you to plead for prayer and people before you ever do anything else. You ever been in a place where all you can do is pray? You ever been in a place in your life where all you could do? You've had people tell you that, listen, all we can do is pray today. No, that's the, that's the first thing we should do. That's where the weapon and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us begins and some courage builds up inside of us so that we can go and do what God's equipped us to do. It all starts there. You see the framework that Nehemiah is, is building right here for us to take? Is when we have a burden to do something, we have a burden to carry a divine discontent, we drop to our knees in prayer and we pray for days? Come on, we can't even read our Bible for 10 minutes sometimes. We're so distracted. Amen, that's me. I'm right there with you. This is not preach me preaching to you. I'm with you. Look at what Nehemiah is going through. God isn't looking for you to save the world. He's looking for you to tap into the power of the one who can. And it starts with our face on the floor. The second thing that Nehemiah's prayer shows us is 
A divine burden will move you to humble yourself for people. See, Nehemiah didn't view view himself as Persian royalty, even though he was perched in a palace. The Bible says that, verse 6 says, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we, we have sinned against you. We, not them, we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. I don't have it all together. This is Nehemiah going, hey, I've messed it up too. I'm probably not good enough for this. But something in my heart has burdened me to a place where all I know to do is put is lower myself to a servant. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. He's a servant. See, whatever your position in position is when God stirs us he shifts our perspective for what's good for me to what's good for them so that God can show up Nehemiah lowered himself to a servant he was cupbearer to the king your highness and the Bible even goes on to say that Nehemiah was so connected to the king that in order for him to go back to Jerusalem his king king Artaxerxes looked at him and said Hey, are you okay? Come on, there was a close relationship there. He was in the royal family. Nehemiah said, no, I'm not good. I got to go. I need to take a leave of absence. I need to go because some people that I've never met are going through something, and I have a divine burden to do something about it. He was willing to leave his place in the palace. And as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, and listen, if you've never said yes to a relationship with Jesus, that's okay. I'm, we are glad you're here. This place was built for you. But if, you, if you're a Christ follower, if you said, man, like, I, like he, he is Lord of my life. He rules my life. Can I ask you a question? It's a question that I've asked myself for a while now. What is it that burdens you so much? What is the divine discontent inside of you This shifts your perspective of what's maybe best for you, but what breaks God's heart? Because, see, I, I believe that if what breaks God's heart is aligned with what breaks our heart, that's when heaven and earth collide. That's when, uh, on heaven as it is in earth, it's not when, it's, it's when our hearts are breaking and shifting for what breaks God's heart. That's when the miracles start to take place. And I just ask yourself, like, what moves you to plead to God in prayer? As you kick off 2023, as we kick it off together, like, think through that. Just ask yourself, God, what, what burdens your heart? Now, what, burden, what, 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 what breaks your heart? For some of us, maybe, maybe right now what burdens your heart is, is the next generation and the, and the identity crisis that they're walking through right now. Or maybe for some of us, it's, it's the family unit that I talked about earlier that just breaks your heart, that keeps you up at night. That the divorce rate is through the roof, but it's actually even getting higher in the church for people who are involved in the church. Does your, does, maybe your heart breaks for that. Maybe your heart breaks for families, for kids who have no children or have no uh, parents. Maybe it's for families uh, that are just split into a million pieces and there's just, there, there's, there's just a war on it everywhere you look. I don't know what breaks your heart, but what I can tell you right now, it will be the church that ushers people into the, to, in, in from brokenness into restoration. It'll be the church where people can get healing. It will be the church, listen, it will be the church that creates a place where the lost can be found. It'll be the church. It'll be the church. And you can see it here in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is not just going to a city. He's going to the people of God who have been in exile and said, I got to do something. And I'm going to start with the wall. I'm going to start build the wall. 
Because if not, then the enemy can come in and pick you off. One by one, in the night, in the day, your kids, your family members, your friends. And so, as a Christian, I think our divine burden is to build the church. Is to continue to build the church. Not for us. But for people who aren't even here yet. Not for us. But for the people who may be sitting in here right now, who they have no idea what 2023 is going to bring them. And they're going to be going through trials. They're going to be going through hard times. And they're going to need a place to come where they can not meet us, but they can meet Jesus. And he can heal and restore everything that they're going through. It's the church. Come on, can you see it? It's the Jer- Jerusalem is like, it's like the church. It's like, hey, i got to go back and I've got to build it because God's people are there. And they're coming out of exile and people are going to show up. And we got to have a place to protect them. We have to stand unified. And he goes to God and the first thing that he does is he falls on his face in prayer. And can I be honest with you that over the course of my life and the last 10 years I've been in ministry, I haven't always carried this out well either. There have been people that, that have been close to me and far from God and, and the walls of their life had just come down and they needed hope and they needed, they needed Jesus. They needed to be ushered into a place and I've walked right past them. And then I got to a place in my life a couple of years ago where I said, not on my watch. Not anymore. And I'm not perfect. But I was like, man, I can't walk past anyone else. I can't have a relationship with anyone else and see what they're going through. And they're lost and they're broken and they're walking further away from God. And they don't even realize that the hope that they need, the healing that they're looking for, is found in the person of Jesus. And I'm going to bring them. I'm going to usher them to a place. Where God can start to build back, God can start to usher into their hearts and their lives the the power of the Holy Spirit where they can meet him and get to a place that they've never been to before. See, that was Nehemiah's heart. So he dropped to God in prayer, and it was through that prayer that led us to the third thing, and that it moves us to be bold on behalf of people. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, though you're outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I've chosen to make my name dwell there. I love that he said, Hey, God, you remember? As if God is some absent-minded person. See, I don't think Nehemiah said, Hey, God, you forgot about these people. I think Nehemiah was going to God and saying, No, I haven't forgot about what you said. I haven't forgotten. I've stored up these words in my heart, and I haven't forgotten what you told your servant Moses. So I'm going to ask you to do what you said you're going to do, because I'm going to take off, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to start gathering the people together, the people that are in Jerusalem, and know they're going to build the wall with me. Hey, God, you remember what you said? Anybody ever prayed that prayer before? Be bold. It moves us to be bold. On behalf of people. If you read on in Nehemiah chapter 3, it's it's interesting the the pattern that you see. We're not going to read it for the sake of time today. It's interesting, once they started to, he started to gather people together. He went to the Lord in prayer, and the Lord emboldened him. He spoke to him, and he said, all right, God, I'm going. And once he got there... And he gathered the people together. It was interesting. Go read it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. All throughout chapter 3, it says, and next to them they built. And then you read a little bit, and next to them they built. And you read a little bit, it says, and next to them they built. And then after him they built. And then after him they built. And I can picture it now. The people of Jerusalem are standing next to each other, and they are rebuilding the very thing that's going to keep them safe. 
They're, gonna, they're rebuilding the very thing that's going to protect their kids. They're rebuilding the very thing that's going to bring them hope that they can have peace at night, that they can sleep at night without attacks from the enemy, without being so open to attacks, they'll feel safer next to each other. They said, I'm going to build the wall in front of me. I find that interesting. Beam by beam, brick by brick, each of them built a part of that wall. Has God put a burden on your heart for the lost in our area? I'm not trying to bait you emotionally. We're not that church. You know that by now if you've been coming for any amount of time. But has he? Has he given you that burden? Where you fall on your face in prayer for the lost in our area? I'm going to show you this illustration right here. Um, you heard Haley talk about it earlier. We have these things called connection cards. And for the sake of them not going everywhere, I put rubber bands on them. And these are all the connection cards since Easter of 2022. There's over 400 in this stack. And each of them represents a step that somebody took on a Sunday. Today was my first time. Today was my first time I gave my life to Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus. Today was my first time. I want to get baptized. I want to be in a group. Today was my first time I gave my life to Jesus. I want to be in a group. I want to get baptized. I want to get on the dream team. Over and over and over and over and over again, over 400 times in 2022, did someone take a step either in salvation or just showing up to church or, hey, I want to get baptized. Hey, I want to get, I, I get in a team. I want to get in a group. You had people that showed up, and they said, hey, I'm taking a step today. Can I tell you right now, this is why we build the church. This is why. These are the bricks. This is the people that we stand next to and we go, hey, we're going to build a wall today in somebody's life. We're going to get them to a place where God can do something in their life. This is why we build the kingdom of God. And I'm praying and believing that there will be double this next year. Triple this next year. So I don't know if you came to uh, our Christmas Eve services, but you heard, you heard somebody mention it earlier. We talked about it at our Dream Team huddle. And uh, right now we have 396 chairs in this room. We had 467 people show up on December 23rd. You should clap for that. And that's great, but there was nowhere for him to sit. There was nowhere for him to sit. Over the past year, we've averaged a little over 700 people in attendance on, on our worship experience every single Sunday. You should clap for that, too, because that's a lot of people. <laughs> and right here on New Year's Day, I don't know how many people are in this room right now, but there's a good amount of people in here. See, our burden is to continue to build, to continue to make room for people who take these steps, that maybe they're giving Jesus one last shot. Maybe they're giving church one last shot. Maybe they're giving people one last shot. Our burden is to continue to build the kingdom. That's why we're launching a 5 p.m. service. So does it burden your heart like it burdens Nehemiah's? Does it burden my heart like it burdens Nehemiah's to fall on our face in prayer and go, God, we've got to do something. Move us to plead to pray for people. God, move us to be bold for people so that we can continue to build. That's the question that I keep rolling around with. And that's the question I want you to wrestle with. Does it burden you, Victory City? That it's a matter of heaven and hell in people's lives. The people that you know personally, that are close to you yet far from God. 
that you've given them all the counsel you can give them. You've taken them all the shopping sprees you can give them. You've done all the things you can do for them. But yet there still is no hope. Maybe, just maybe, Nehemiah had it right. He said, i got to build something for people to return to so that they can find hope, that they can find healing. And it's in the person of Jesus Christ. It is in no one else. And it will never be. That's the burden that we have to build. So I'm going to ask you, Victory City, this year, a step that you can take is, if you haven't, fall on your face in prayer. What is it that breaks your heart? And align it with, with the God of the universe. And let's commit 2023 to where we spend enough time on our face and on our, hand, on our knees, that God, you burden us. You burden me, and I don't know what to do, but give me the boldness to go help build the kingdom for people to come so that you can reconcile the wrecking that's going on in their life right now. Because that's, that's the burden that we have. Tomorrow night, we'll have a, we're going to have a builder's meeting at 6.30. We're going to build the five. We're going to build a 5 p.m. service starting next week. You've heard about it. You've seen it. You're going to get a card on the way out today that talks about it. And can I just be real honest? If you haven't, if, if that's not a burden on your heart, don't, don't feel obligated to come to that. But if it's bur- like the lost in this area burdens you, maybe it's your kid's friends. Maybe it's your own kid. You go, man, I... I I got to do something. I've been on my face in prayer. I'm going to stay on my face in prayer. And it's time to take action. Show up tomorrow night, right here at the church at 630. You'll get more information on it later. But if that's not you, if you're already serving here, you're already building the kingdom, if that's you, stay on your face in prayer. And we're going to build at 5 p.m. Because we're going to create more room for people to find hope we're gonna we're gonna make more room for people to show up and not find us but find the person of Jesus the only one who can save them and change their life we're gonna make more room for them and we're gonna build it and God's gonna bring them amen you bow your heads with me as we close today I don't want to pass up the opportunity to for someone here who, who maybe there's some of the people that, that I just mentioned. They're struggling. They, they're lost and far from God, and they've tried to do it all, all by themselves. And, and God's stirring something in their hearts right now. I want to speak to, to you for just a second. Because I don't want you to walk out of here without hope any longer. I don't want you to walk out of here without a relationship with Jesus, the Savior of the world, the person who gave it all, who laid down his life for you. I don't want you to walk out today without that. So I'm going to, we're going we're gonna to go to God in prayer. We're going to say this corporately, all together. Say, Jesus, come into my life today. Thank you that you had a burden. To, send, to, to lay down your life for me so that I could find hope, I could find healing, and I could have a relationship with you for the rest of my life. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you've said that prayer for the first time, will you lift your hand for just a second? Lift it up high so we can see it. Yeah, I see you. We love you. You can put your hands down. God, thank you so much for the lives that were changed today. God, thank you so much that you've called us to a burden to continue to make more room to build. God, let us, for 2023, start in the position in prayer with our face down, focused on you. Because, God, that's when we're going to get the boldness. 
God, that's where we're, you're going to move in our hearts in such a way that's going to call us to do something about it. And God, we're going to continue to do our best to build the kingdom for you. So that hope can be found. Joy can be restored. And salvation can happen in people's lives through you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen.